Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week. Every single Monday, I give you a recap of all the latest Starship updates, space launches, and other tidbits and stories from the world of spaceflight. We have so much to talk about this week, from a whole host of Starship updates, the massive and long-awaited rollout of NASA's Artemis 1, and successful launches from America, China, and Kazakhstan. Let's get into things. A particularly exciting spectacle we got to bear witness to last week, as I'm sure you're all aware by now, was the third full stack of Ship 20 and Booster 4, this one following in similar footsteps to the previous stack in that SpaceX used the catch arms to perform the ship lift and placement. Unlike the last two stacks of the rocket though, which were basically just fit checks and for show, this time SpaceX conducted the first ever cryo test of a fully stacked Starship and Super Heavy. Frost appeared on all four main tanks of the rocket, confirming that both ship and booster were loaded with cryogenic liquid. SpaceX shared some gorgeous official photos of the stack, including this drone shot from way far out. I really, really hope that SpaceX put the drone back here to take a video of the first orbital launch attempt. Can you imagine how insane that would look? Now, not too long after the stack, Ship 20 was de-stacked once again. I would imagine that, like the last few cryo tests that we've seen, this was more of a test of stage zero rather than the ship and booster themselves, and with this cryo test complete and apparently successful, I wonder what the future holds for these two vehicles. They're practically ancient in terms of Starship hardware now, still sporting Raptor 1 and a few other outdated designs in their construction. I really hope we still get to see these things make the first orbital launch attempt, but with Raptor 2 compatible ships very close to completion, I also wouldn't be that surprised if these are retired and a newer generation ship and booster combination makes the first orbital flight. We will just have to wait and see though. It looks like SpaceX are getting ready to install Booster 8's header tank. Starbase photos caught this shot of crews power washing it inside and out. He also caught a sneaky shot of Ship 24's aft section receiving its heat shield tiles as well, which is good confirmation that SpaceX are pressing ahead with the future models of Starship and Super Heavy. Starbase photos is relatively new to the Boca Chica photography scene. Go check him out on Twitter for great Starship content. I love this video they took of the full stack actually. This perspective really highlights the scale of the booster in ways that distant shots like this don't really capture in the same way. Takes me back to the olden days when Austin Barnard would capture these videos of the Starships rolling down the highway. While we're on the subject of humans for scale, Nick Ansuini caught this lovely photo of engineers working on the rocket and the tower's quick disconnect arm, and they really are dwarfed by the monstrous structures around them. The wide bay is also coming along very nicely. Nick shared this photo of the wide bay and high bay in the morning light, and I gotta say, it's crazy how small the wide bay is making the high bay look. I'm getting the same feelings I felt when we first saw the high bay going up and how big it was compared to everything else at Starbase, and now it's looking almost modest against the skyline. A couple of weeks ago, we covered Elon's offer of donating a retired Starship vehicle to Brownsville Airport, an offer to which, of course, the airport happily agreed to, as would any of us, I'm sure. Well, we've started seeing Starship hardware begin materialising at the site. There's this flag-like assembly here, presumably because of the play on words, flap pole. <laughs> This flap is one of the few surviving pieces of Starship SN8, so is definitely of historical importance in the Starship program, given that this helped steer the first ever full-scale Starship prototype, and to that end it did extremely well. It was the engines that caused the demise of SN8, the flaps and other control systems operated flawlessly. Starship Gazer caught this photo of one of Booster 4's grid fins rotated. I don't believe we've ever seen rotational testing of the grid fins of Booster 4 before, so it's cool to see SpaceX diligently testing these systems. There was a pretty big event for SpaceX last week. On the 14th of March, SpaceX celebrated its 20th birthday. What a ride it has been. I think we've all seen this photo now of SpaceX's first day with Elon and his maracas. For those that don't know the story, SpaceX's first rocket was the Falcon 1, a small sat launch vehicle with aspirations to eventually have a reusable first stage, to the extent that SpaceX actually performed some recovery tests of the first stage booster. However, it failed to achieve orbit on its first three launches, and the fourth attempt really was a make or break moment for SpaceX. Elon has since stated that if the fourth flight failed, then that would have been curtains for SpaceX. 
Luckily, it was a success, and the Falcon 1 went on to perform an incredible one launch before being completely retired in favour of the Falcon 9, which of course since became arguably the most successful medium lift launch vehicle of all time, with its first stage being successfully recovered for the first time in 2015, and now it routinely flies with reflown boosters. And who can forget Falcon Heavy, currently the most powerful operational rocket in existence, for now at least, which comes with the world's coolest party trick of having simultaneously landing boosters. And then here we are today, watching the future unfold before us with Starship development, which as we all know will utterly flip the space industry on its head if it works as SpaceX intended to. Happy 20th birthday to SpaceX, and here's to the next 20. Now I think the biggest event of last week in the eyes of many, myself included, was the long-awaited rollout of NASA's massive Artemis 1 rocket, the Space Launch System, better known simply as SLS. It rolled out of the Vehicle Assembly Building at a blistering speed, at one point nearly reaching an entire one mile per hour which is actually pretty impressive considering the size of the rocket and the associated structures around it, like the launch tower. Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, shared this amusing shot of one of the engineers holding up a banana for scale. <laughs> Over the course of many hours, the orange Leviathan travelled from High Bay 3 of the Vehicle Assembly Building all the way out to Launch Complex 39B at the Kennedy Space Center. The payload for this rocket is the Orion spacecraft, seen at the top of the stack in this shot here, courtesy of Sean of Deimos Photography. Great shots from him as always. Sean is trying to grow his following on Twitter, and he takes really great pictures of launches and events from the Cape, so give him a follow on Twitter if you enjoy this sort of content. He'll be posting some unique images of the SLS throughout its stay at the pad, and during its eventual rollback. The rollout of SLS is all part of NASA's preparation for the Artemis 1 test flight, which will be the first integrated test of the Orion spacecraft, space launch system rocket, and all of the supporting ground systems. Artemis 1 will be an uncrewed flight test that will lay down the foundations for future crewed flights, and during this mission, the Orion will fly further from the Earth than any spacecraft built for humans has ever flown, travelling thousands of miles beyond the Moon over the course of about four to six weeks. The Orion will also be staying in space longer than any ship made for astronauts has done before, without docking to a space station that is, and will return home faster and hotter than any that have come before it. Being such a record-breaking flight, there's quite a lot of unknowns here that NASA understandably want to test before strapping astronauts inside the capsule, hence the need for the Artemis 1 test flight, which will hopefully be a big success and help NASA to validate all of the components of the SLS rocket and Orion spacecraft. And the testing doesn't just start with the launch. We've already seen extensive tests of the RS-25 engines that power the first stage, as well as destructive tests of the rocket's fuel tanks. Next month, this rocket will be loaded up with fuel and undergo a few other tests, not unlike what we see with SpaceX's Starship, to confirm that all systems are safe and ready for launch. So far, the planned launch date is May 2022, and if all goes to plan, then Artemis 2 will launch in May 2024, carrying astronauts on a crewed lunar flyby. From there, Artemis 3 will launch the following year, and will involve a crewed lunar rendezvous and landing. Hopefully the SLS program doesn't face any more delays so that we can finally see astronauts walk the lunar surface again. As for launches that have already happened, we saw a few of them last week. A notable one was a successful launch from Astra on Tuesday. Yes, Rocket 3 has certainly seen its fair share of developmental setbacks, very few rockets don't, but it looks like they're finally getting into their stride with this launch vehicle. Last week, Rocket 3.3 took off from the Kodiak launch site in Alaska, carrying a single technology demonstration CubeSat from Portland State Aerospace Society, and 20 Space B CubeSats from Swarm Technologies. Swarm Technologies is a private company that's building a low Earth orbit satellite constellation for communication with Internet of Things devices, and they've been slowly adding to their constellation since 2018, and have made use of quite a number of rockets actually. They've flown aboard the Indian PSLV XL, Falcon 9, Electron, Vega, PSLV DL, and now Rocket 3.3. The satellites themselves are pretty small, weighing just 400 grams each and measuring 11 by 11 by 3 centimeters in size. And this is actually only due to the housing needing to be big enough to be detectable by space surveillance systems. The satellites could be made much smaller. In fact, Swarm made a few waves in the industry with the launch of its first four test satellites in 2018, which were considered too small by the FCC and were prohibited from flying. Despite this though, they were launched anyway aboard an Indian PSLV rocket, leading to the FCC slapping Swarm with a $900,000 fine. Future satellites have therefore had enlarged housing. 
Now, the next launch we saw last week was on Thursday and was a Chinese Long March 4C, which carried a single Yaogan 3402 satellite to low Earth orbit. The Yaogan series of satellites, Yaogan meaning remote sensing, are operated by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and this particular satellite, according to Chinese state media, will be used to provide information services such as land census, urban planning, crop yield estimation, and disaster prevention and reduction. On Friday, we saw a crewed Soyuz launch from Kazakhstan. Stam. This was the MS-21 mission to the International Space Station, carrying the usual three cosmonauts. I am sure that some tension would probably have been in the air among the crew of the station, given Russia's appalling, unprovoked, and premeditated invasion of Ukraine. Curiously, the cosmonauts emerged from the Soyuz sporting bright yellow suits with blue trim, the colors of the Ukrainian flag, which left many people speculating about the meaning behind this. Roscosmos officially responded simply by stating that there was just a lot of yellow fabric, which I'd say is probably not the real reason. The real reason that I, and a few others believe, is that this is a failed propaganda move. Russia probably expected to have fully taken Ukraine by this point, and the arrival of the crew to the station would have been part of the celebration of their victory, with the cosmonauts wearing Ukrainian colors to signify Ukraine's incorporation into Russia. Due to the multiple failures of the Russian army in Ukraine, this of course hasn't happened, so this almost comes across like the cosmonauts themselves are wearing yellow and blue in protest of the war. This is almost certain Certainly not true though. They don't make their own suits and there is no way at all that Roscosmos wouldn't have found out about a secret suit swap. I'd love to know what the crew of the ISS are talking about on the station, but if the cosmonauts are against the war, it's highly unlikely they would publicly state this unless the Kremlin were to fall. Anyway, I'm going to move on from this topic now. SpaceX had a record-breaking flight on Saturday. This was another Starlink mission, which saw a Falcon 9 rocket launch 53 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. What made this launch special was the fact that this particular first stage booster, B1051, had already supported 11 previous flights, and this was the first time that SpaceX had flown a booster for the 12th time. And shortly afterward, it became the first booster to land 12 times as well, as it safely touched down on the drone ship just read the instructions about nine minutes after liftoff. If this wasn't enough, this flight was also record-breaking in that the payload for this launch was the heaviest payload ever flown by Falcon 9, weighing in at around 16 and a quarter metric tons, which for my American viewers is the same as 38,325 and a half Wendy's Baconator burgers. But yes, what a week it's been. I'm so happy to finally see SLS rolled out. Like, I knew it was real because we've seen photos and videos of it in the vehicle assembly building, but now it's out in the open, it sort of feels a bit more like it's real. Does that make sense? Seeing it on the launch pad just evokes new levels of hype like never felt before. What also evokes hype is seeing the names that are scrolling on screen. They're my generous channel members and Patreon supporters, and without them, none of this would be possible. These videos do cost money to make, as a lot of the footage I use isn't free, and so their generosity allows me to continue making these videos every single week for all of you. If you want to join the squad, then there are links in the description and on screen. And hey, there are two video suggestions on screen that are also from my channel. Hopefully they look interesting. Anyway, that's it. Goodbye.